Thank you. Um, all right. So this is cool. I have a small group here because these are these are one where some of the coolest ideas emerge, in my opinion. Um, so um, my name is Maggie. I um, I'm here representing uh, an organization that I co-founded called the Reclaim Justice Movement. And essentially, it's me and some friends and my partner trying to um, build an abolitionist future, contribute to the movement that's already happening. Um, there are a number of us who are mental health providers as well, and there's some clear um, reckoning that needs to be done with the ways in which mental health providers kind of buttress um, the prison industrial complex, which is a term we'll get into if you're not familiar with already. Um, so essentially, the, it's called Reclaim Justice Movement because we um, want to get closer and closer to centering the concept of justice on a genuine response to harm and for the person and communities who are harmed to be able to own that that definition rather than allow the criminal legal system to uh, define it and practice it the way that they want to. So with that, um, we can jump in. So here are the goals that you may have already seen. Um, I want to um, say up front that my plan is to have this be really dynamic and I have a few um, pair shares that are speckled in between content. So the general rhythm is that I'm gonna give us some content to react to. And then um, I still think we could do pair shares because there's five of us, if my counting is correct. Um, so I think that we could still do some good pair shares and I'll kind of pop into different pairs. Um, and then we'll just bring it back to the group and uh, we'll probably not share necessarily what you talked about in pairs um, just to kind of keep things moving. But at the end, we'll share kind of a, a case example and an imagination um, process that we'll use on, on how to build an alternative. So we'll do more communal sharing with that part. So that's just a heads up on kind of where this is going and what the structure will look like. So what is mandated reporting? I just took this definition. Most of us are familiar with the idea. Um, it's essentially right telling a third party, normally a government agency, um, according to a policy or procedure um, by requirement um, that a harm has taken place, a specific harm. So um, there are lots of different types of mandated reporting, right? Through some examples out here. Um, but I wanna focus today on child abuse because it seems like, I mean, whenever I talk to people in general, um, not even people in mental health, people care about child safety. It's like a pretty baseline, like lots of different opinions on other groups of people, but everyone seems to really have like a baseline opinion about keeping kids safe. So let's talk about child safety. So um, since it's a smaller group, um, I wanna, I think I want to share an example with you about how this presentation is personal. So let me, I'll stop share for a minute. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to share an example of just some, it wasn't even mandated reporting, but it was reporting to CPS um, and why I think it just doesn't work. Cause that's my, that's my stance. That's the bias that I'm coming in with. Um, so we, I ended up having, uh, not having to, I reported uh, to CPS related to some family members. Um, and uh, I reported a specific family member to CPS. And this person had has a lot of power and privilege in society. And um, I thought, I tried all these other things. I tried to confront them directly. I tried to even do kind of like free coaching sessions, right? Um, to have some Zoom meetings set up or whatever. And um, essentially the, the person kind of manipulated the situation and they were still doing the same type of harm. And so um, they also had a connection with CPS local to them. And, and that was attached to the power and privilege that they held. Um, so I ended up calling just like the federal, like the um, national hotline because I knew that the local people wouldn't be as responsive. And um, essentially that person's life wasn't really affected very much and it was found unsubstantiated and um, 
and their their father, who has even more power and privilege, um, kind of came in and manipulated the situation as well. So to me, it was um, a very clear example of how um, there are certain rules that don't apply to certain people. Um, and I had a sense that it was generally harmful for people who don't have resources. And then I had this visceral experience of how it doesn't even touch people who do have resources um, in terms of the harm that they could cause their kids. So with that, um, I want to hopefully inspire y'all to share um, either a professional or personal example of mandated reporting that you've experienced. And if no example comes to mind, um, maybe you could share just in general how mandated reporting plays out in your day to day or the specter of it. So I'm just going to do um, like pair share breakout rooms. We'll just make two of them. Um, and Micah, if you, I don't know if you want to participate at all, if you want to just join one. Uh, looks like Dr. Dr. Morris. Morris. Yeah. I'm not doing clinical work right now, so I don't <laughs> <laughs> have a lot to say, but okay. Well, I'll join that one with you if you want to. Oh, we have an, another person. Looks like I'll join it, Doctor. Okay. Hello again. Hello, Micah. Uh, are you bet in between sessions or? No, we're doing uh, breakout rooms right now. So we're um, we're talking about mandated reporting. Mm -hmm. um, so if you'd like, I can assign you to one of these groups and you can talk about mandated reporting with uh, the people in there. Um, how, how, how much, what time did you start? Uh, we've only been going, for, we've been going for maybe five to 10 minutes. Okay. Why don't I, um, log off and come back to the next one since it's already started and people are in breakouts and stuff, don't you think? Yeah, that's fine. If you want to do that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right. All right. Um, so we'll keep we'll keep switching up the pair shares as we go. Um, I mean, there's only so many variations of it, right? But uh, but I hope that y'all had some good conversation. I certainly did with Dr. Morse. Um, so I'm gonna get back into the slides over here. Uh, all right. So. Briefly, for the history of mandated reporting, um, y'all might already know this, but essentially um, in 1962, a pediatrician uh, discovered the idea of battered child syndrome and then um, and wrote a paper about it and then advocated for a public policy that requires healthcare workers to report abuse. Um, it's just the most amazing, I had to like double take at this, <laughs> in three years, that translated into 50 states adopting a mandated reporting law. Um, when I was talking with my partner about this, I was, they were like, well, what, like what happened in that time period <laughs> that would have fueled this level of, of response? I don't know. Um, but then it wasn't until 1974 that we have a federal um, uh, law in place, the CAPTA or Child Abuse Prevention Treatment Act, which funds states who have programs essentially. Um, so it's it's kind of new. Like it feels like something that's been around forever, but it's kind of a new thing. Um, if you think 50 years ago is new. But it's it hasn't been around forever. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
Um, and so in the same article, it describes the history. Um, the article itself is called A Policy Without Reason. And this is written by someone who is very much involved in um, in a lot of the twists and turns on the federal level and legislature. Um, and he posits that mandated reporting doesn't work because child abuse and maltreatment is complicated. Um, he does mention in the article too that um, child abuse definitions really conflate poverty with harm. Um, and you can't really differentiate them as many of us have probably seen in practice. Um, and it's impossible to constantly monitor everyone with CPS. And the person who originally wrote this article on battered child syndrome, however good their intentions may be, um, grossly underestimated how, how ubiquitous harm is, how many people harm their children. It's a much bigger issue than just kind of aberrations of one-off instances. Um, and then it also kind of detracts um, and redirects other people who just defer to this third party source instead of intervening themselves. Um, so here's just a quote that I pulled that I thought also elucidated that, which is essentially it detracts, distracts policymakers from looking at the core drivers of, of what causes harm and abuse towards children. Um, in another framing of, of what happens with mandated reporting, and you all have maybe seen this, um, and for more disclosure, my partner is um, a defense attorney. So I've seen um, a number of child abuse cases from a criminal perspective and watching different, um, it's within the military courts martial. Um, and you see this, this dynamic play out where clinicians are confused, it's gray, they defer whatever thoughts they have to the criminal legal system. And then the criminal legal system then justifies whatever decisions they make from clinician concern and documentation. And so it's kind of like a self-feeding apparatus that keeps moving, right? Or a self-justifying system. Um, and you, the folks that are here are probably familiar with, with some of these stats um, that more than 250,000 children are removed from their homes each year. Um, current estimates, or this is from really 2020, um, the foster care system holds nationally more than 400,000 kids. Um, and I had the double take on, on this next stat. Um, in uh, analysis of data from 2003 to 2014, 37.4% um, of all children will be subjected or were subjected to child maltreatment investigation. That's almost half. <laughs> um, that's, that's wild to me. And then more than half of all black children will be subjected to maltreatment investigations. That's every other black child who you meet will be subjected to the child maltreatment investigation. And obviously this is notwithstanding um, like neighborhood and um, class implications, right? So maybe not ones that um, families that you meet, but, um, but depending on where you are, it could be even more, right? Um, and so in, an, in uh, a social a social worker out of Rutgers um, analyzed from an intersectional perspective why um, poor Black families are overrepresented in the CPS system. We have about 20% of kids who are Black um, compared to 13% of our population. Um, so we're looking at class, gender, and race. Um, that essentially some points that that she took out were that we have the 1990s, which is the draining of welfare, of social welfare services, and kind of a shift towards punitive uh, approaches to crime and behavior that's that people don't like. Um, and we also uh, have further like your um, kind of biases in the system, uh, Eurocentric ways of evaluating whether someone is a fit parent. Um, and I thought this quote was really important um, in a number of like facts that kind of all culminate in this idea that that CPS has from the beginning had a very tight relationship with the criminal legal system with the goal of punishing parents deemed unfit by using the power of the law to inflict state led punishment. So it is a punitive apparatus. Um, and from the beginning, they were clear that they were punitive, even if now they kind of appear as a social welfare type of thing. 
So what are the experiences of kids and caregivers who are wrapped up in this process? Um, unsurprisingly, there are limited perspectives given by children. Um, but in general, you see themes of fear and avoidance. Um, you've probably experienced this in your work if you've done stuff clinically. People are unsure what they can share or what what they share will result in, right? With uh, kind of exacerbating an already existing distrust of, of providers. Um, and I thought these quotes were really important to take out. This article was a meta synthesis of qualitative research. And, um, and one says, I was afraid that if I told my children would be taken away, which I'm, I've heard a number of times um, in clinical work. And when I cleaned up toward the end of my pregnancy, my social worker promised me if I was clean when I gave birth to my baby, he wouldn't be apprehended. Yes, I was clean for 60 days and he still apprehended my baby. This stuff is heartbreaking, right? And it happens every day. Um, and when I think back to the original example I shared, I'm so frustrated with seeing children be harmed by people with resources and then seeing people without resources um, treated punitively and having their environments even worsened and exacerbated. So in a figure, this is what's going on. Um, we have families that need all of these things on the left side. And then instead we give them surveillance, threat of separation, threat of punishment. But I see here a dialectic that on one hand, you know, families need freedom from intervention by the state to be able to have self-determination agency and to be able to thrive. But on the other hand, we know that families um, incubate violence a lot of the time. They can recreate um, really harmful structures. And so how do we balance these two things? And I don't have the answer and I'm not claiming to have the answer, but I think it'll involve all of us getting creative together. Um, so I took this, this was actually a meme, um, but I thought, why not, right? Um, the stuff on the internet's really good sometimes. Um, so this person had, I believe it was a tweet said, my children literally cannot talk back to me because what society calls back talk is simply a conversation where you hold all the power and ultimate say. Furthermore, the opinions, ideas, and boundaries of the other person are so insignificant to you, you won't even entertain them long enough to hear them out. I respect my kids enough to always hear them out. Their voices matter. My kids don't backtalk. We have conversations. And I'm saying this, this is aspirational, right? But this is also analyzing a power structure that exists that's kind of normative um, about how we view children and their status in society. And um, this is also a struggle for me personally, as I have a three-year-old who slapped me across the face multiple times, right? I want to hear him out, but these things are hard. It's hard to be a parent. Right. Um, so I want to also highlight, um, and I believe that's my friend, Allison, that we can let in if that's cool. Um, so there, uh, the definitions of harm and abuse are politicized. And um, one thing I want to highlight um, is we are probably all very sensitive to this right now. More than 25 states introduced bills labeling gender affirming care as child abuse. Right. So potentially people in those 25 states um, might be technically required to mandate, to might be technically mandated to report parents giving their kids gender affirming care. Um, so I wanna take a minute and um, do a little pair share again um, and talk about just creative responses to child safety because I think we're building a picture here that what we have now is not working. And um, we have um, children being politicized and wielded as tokens. We have social constructions of what harm and abuse is. Um, and we have state violence as a response to um, often poverty and other um, ish complicated issues. So let's talk for a minute about how comfortable you would feel intervening in in these different kids' lives, if you notice that there was harm or abuse happening. And I'm not talking about mandated reporting, I'm just talking about you see something in the moment, how comfortable do you feel intervening? 
So let's just do a little brief breakout room. Let me stop sharing. Um, so I don't know if we could share this while we're going, but if you can memorize this, your kid, your neighbor's kid, your sibling's kid, and a kid you've never met in a public area. So just on a scale of one to five. Shoot. I think I need to recreate the rooms. I think, move. yeah, you can move people. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So I'm going to, um, we definitely had some interesting conversation in our group. I'm going to uh, keep it moving with the slides because I really want to get to this scenario because I want to see what y'all come up with because we're building towards that. Um, all right. So briefly, like some terms that I think a lot of people who chose to come to a CE like this are already familiar with. Um, one definition of the prison industrial complex is this this use, this focus on surveillance, policing, and imprisonment to solve economic, social, and political problems. So here's a visual depiction of how, of what the PIC looks like. So it's just very expansive to include what's been called family policing or use of child protective services. So these things are used to address all these issues listed on the left, and it often results in further exacerbating the original harms, which are over on the right. And I can send these slides out to y'all too, if you want to look at them more. Um, and so there's, it's more sticky than just the existence of these structures and systems. We've, a lot of us have internalized um, the processes and ideology of these structures and systems. So um, these are two terms that kind of describe how we've internalized. A lot of us internalize these things. Um, we um, moralize a lot of behavior, right? Um, we associate justice with punishment. Um, we can't think of anything besides punishment for issues. Sometimes I feel my, my mind close in on that idea. Like I can't even think of other things and, um, it really pigeonholes us. Um, and then legality, um, we often scrutinize what harm is, um, based on even an idea of a legal definition, even if we don't know the legal definition, right? This, these processes play out. Um, abolition is one counterforce to the PIC, which is a political vision of dismantling uh, the criminal legal system and building something different. So it's both breaking the, something and building something. It's both a practical strategy of investigating our own behaviors and our communities and a long-term goal and an endpoint. Um, so I'm just going to kind of blow through this to the abolition imagination part. So um, we'll just take five minutes for this group collab. Um, so uh, let's imagine a world where there's no mandated reporting. Like there's no one to call. Your cell phone is broken. You know, it's not it's not possible. Um, the scenario is that your uh, your client is undocumented and she, she shares with you that she leaves her six year old at home to watch her three year old for three to four hours each day after school while your client goes to work. So here are some questions to ask. Do you still feel obligated to intervene? You don't have to. Why or why not? And what assumptions and values come up? And what it, what would an intervention look like without, without this mandated reporting, right? Without using an institution. So stop sharing. Oh, whoops. I was, um, thing popped up, but I accidentally touched my screen and it went away.
Let's see. I think I can put. Oh wait, are you still here, Cassandra? Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I got some good conversation brainstorming with Cassandra. Um, so I'm hoping that we can just take these last few minutes and talk about what kind of creative things you all thought of. How do you help this person? Or do you help them? Or do you intervene? And feel free to just jump in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So we we were talking about um, you know looking at local churches or synagogues or um, other agencies in the area. I mean, even Child Protective Services itself has a in New Mexico. There's a program within that's within the same building as Child Protective Services, which kind of sucks because I think it would deter a lot of people where you can go and request services like respite. So if you have a, a child who's like high needs and um, you're at your wits end, you can go and do an intake there and get um, support and help and respite um, for you uh, as a parent. Um, so they have there's some programs like that, um, and I think that I I think we were talking about the the harm that the complication that comes from reporting from having it reported and having it escalate that kind of thing escalate when it doesn't need to be escalated and decisions being made. <clears throat> I think Allison could probably fill you in more on that um, in terms of her example, but decisions being made that make the whole situation 10 times worse. So, so on like, uh, if you're the provider, um, are you saying that you bring them to this, like these services that are located next to CPS where, and this is an imaginary world where CPS isn't really there. <laughs> um like is that is that your intervention or like your or you, you also mentioned talking to local a, community religious yeah. structures and yeah I think the CPS thing is hard to, to swallow um because it is right next to CPS but some you know I know that some parents jump on it I mean a lot of people use it they go and they feel comfortable enough to make the phone call and say hey I need help um I don't want this to escalate into a bad situation. So, um, yeah, I, I, that is an option and it could be the last option. Um, if you can't find other resources. Um, I shared a real life example of a friend of a friend that this very similar situation happened. Um, and just how it really escalated. And I think um, just helping find childcare. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, whether it's, uh, Dr. Moore said, like through a church or through a community or through um, the neighborhood or through like kids, like um, not kids, kids, but like teenagers wanting to get make a little money or, I think there's a lot of creative solutions um, because my client or not my friend of a friend, she has her kid, her kids are now in another country where she doesn't have access to them. She was arrested and went to jail for going to buy milk for her baby and leaving two of the younger kids. And then the dad took advantage of that and took them to another country and she can't criminal charges have been camped. It's not a client. Um, have been dropped but she now doesn't have access to her kids she can't get to them so i just think it's really sad how that escalated yeah and i i'm i picked this example because i think so many there are so many scenarios where things could escalate like that and a lot of them are 
like neglect that don't take into the account the intentions or the context that the person mm-hmm. is doing this thing within. Right. Um, and, you know, I think about it all the time with me and my partner or queer family and some people might kind of label the, our existence as abusive, um, right. That we have two kids and I would be scared shitless, excuse my language. Um, you know, if we were subjected to some kind of CPS investigation, even if there's nothing, you know, that I can point to that we did, um, but everything when scrutinized can also be kind of contorted and, and turned into something else. But what I'm also hearing is that it's really hard to hear this example and not think of all the worst case scenarios and think of essentially the criminal legal system bearing down, right? Because like I started this with like, let's pretend it doesn't exist. Let's pretend you don't have to report. And then everyone got kind of nervous about like, well, we got to address it. When I was talking to Cassandra too, we were like, we got to address this quickly before you get in trouble, right? Um, there's still that fear that's even there among providers. So I, I think it's really interesting that that came up and might've like restricted our imaginations and creativity a little bit. Um, what do you all think about that? I agree. Yeah, totally. It's um, It's become part of sort of in a I didn't want to fight this but it sort of feels like part of my DNA <laughs> yeah that's real yeah it's real and like you're I don't know how much younger you are than me but you know I've been in practice here since 1994 you probably weren't born I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I was I was little <laughs> okay so it's like it's it you know and i've been doing you know and i love that i love this because you're really making me think outside the box um although you know i'm typically someone who you know i'm also have a queer family myself and so i've also really relate to you in that way but um and i think outside the box when i work with these with the the uh clients who are accused of things um and i do things differently but yeah i mean to take that away to take that fear away and to take that sort of mandate away and to really um confront you know to really look at and like open door uh, op- like it's an opening it's very different can't hear you there you go me me talking on mute again uh okay for usual talking to myself again um but yeah it it, um I like the way that you phrased all of that too um of it almost feeling like it's in your DNA and then the way that it could change your perspective or even the way that your brain feels thinking about it without the mandate um it's hard it's hard to imagine um so with that um I know that I'm at the end of my time um, I just want to go to the last slide here. Um, so basically like this, I just want to emphasize that this is the beginning. These are the beginnings of a conversation. Um, and that's, we are all going to have to get really creative together to imagine a different world. Um, and what does that look like? Um, as Dr. Morse says, without, without that fear, um, what could things look like? Um, why didn't, the person's neighbors recognize that the six-year-old was home alone, right? What what ways um, are, does our environment make us so busy that it's really hard to intervene or even notice things, right, um, in our community? Um, so I just wanna point you to um, a couple other resources. Um, these are three organizations that have been in the arena for a while and have done a lot of interesting work and analysis. Generation Five, um, which is focused on child sexual abuse, uh, movement for family power, um, as opposed to family policing, and uh, another organization called Mandated Reporting is not neutral. Um, so again, I could send these slides out. I could send them maybe through Micah or the. I think Dylan was a student representative, and get them out to you. But thank you so much for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. I like their small group, and um, yeah, thank you. It was good to meet all of you. Thank you. Great to meet you.